afternoon and good morning everyone depending uh, on where you are so we are going to get started with our workshop sport for protection connecting refugees through sport and it is lovely to see you joining and i really would like to welcome you all so um i just want to introduce myself so my name is chiara and I'm with the education team at UNHCR, so the UN Agency for Refugees. I work on, on a global primary education program that is implemented in 14 country locations around the world. And this program, uh, that is the Educate a Child program, aims at enhancing, so expanding and widening access to quality education for refugee children who are out of school. So now uh, you might be wondering why an education expert is facilitating a workshop about sport. And you also might be asking uh, what sport has to do uh, with education. Well, <laughs> this is actually one of um, today's webinar goals and we will try to understand uh, throughout the, the webinar, um, the multiplier effects of sport. And so we will try to see what is the power of sport and how a sport can contribute and bring a positive effect also on education. But I really do not want to spoil or reveal too much. So I'm handing over to the real sport for protection expert, Megumi, for a short introduction. Thank you, Kiara. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Megumi Awiyama, and I work um, with UNHCR as a refugee sport coordination team in the headquarters, um, where we really look at um, using sport as a tool to achieve better protection and development outcomes for forcibly displaced youth and children. Um, I work on fostering uh, partnerships with sport organization, as well as helping uh, sport organizations um, to be able to implement programs in the field. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to the workshop today, um, and welcome. So just moving on to the agenda of today's workshop. So uh, we are going to be talking today about the power of sport to connect refugees. And there will be a short introduction about what it means to be a refugee and what are the protection challenges that refugee children and youth experience. We are also going to be talking about UNHCR's sport for protection approach. And through some case studies, we are going to explore how sport can, can become a tool for social inclusion, social cohesion, and education attainment in refugee settings. And of course, as we are all in this together, so we are all living in this weird time, we will try to see how UNHCR and our partners are supporting sport and fund-based activities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Moving on to the next slide. So as you can see here, we have uh, three workshop goals for the workshop this afternoon. So, um, as you might know, uh, for children and youth who have to flee their homes and are forced to make dangerous journeys to find safety in another country, sport is not just a leisure activity, but it is much more. Sport activities can in fact help refugees connect. And this is the first goal of today's workshop, to gain an understanding of the role sport can play in connecting individuals and groups to create inclusive and cohesive communities. The second goal is to appreciate the benefits of sport for protection programs um, and to see what are these benefits that uh, sport can bring to young people, especially to those who are of school age and live in forced displacement contexts. And finally, our third goal of today is to gain a better understanding of this protective and connecting role that sport can play even during the COVID-19 pandemic. So moving on to the next slide, just some practical information and some practical reminders. So uh, we would like you to keep your mic muted, but very importantly, feel free to ask questions in the chat or via the questions and answer sessions that will be towards the end of the workshop. So we will be monitoring in the chat um, the question in the chat and we will pick them up during the Q&A session. And I will shortly explain the Mintimeter activity and show you how to access the app. So moving on to the Mintimeter activity. So this is a nice breaker activity, or we can call it a warm up. So like during a training or pre-match, 
you know, we cannot neglect a warm up. So let's proceed with uh, a warm up activity. And we are now going to connect through Mentimeter, which is an interactive presentation platform. And for those who are not familiar with Mentimeter, you can find on this slide a few practical instructions. So first of all, connect to menti.com. You can connect to the website by either using your phone or your laptop. And once you are connected to menti.com, you enter the digit code that is on the slide. So 2781466. Um, and you click on submit, and then you will be directed to the icebreaker activity. Remember that while you are entering your input, remember to take a look at the presentation because you will be able to visualize all the inputs. I see if we move on to the next slide, Megumi. Super, I see that some people are entering some ideas. Okay, so the idea is to create a collage, uh, a work cloud of you know, ideas and thoughts that come straight to mind when you think about sport. But remember, when you enter your ideas and thoughts, try to, to think about the role that sport can play for refugee children and youth. Okay, I see that people are contributing. I see the biggest the biggest idea is actually team. Um, I see also community, bring people together, fun, team up, passion, teamwork. So it is actually clear that sport helps bring in people from different ages, from different cultures, ethnicities, gender identities, different backgrounds together together around you know, a shared interest in sports and it does increase community ties, it does increase intergroup social engagement, brilliant. So I'm happy to know that technology was on our side and I would like to thank you for your contribution. I'm now um, handing it over to Megumi. Thanks. Great, um, thank you, Kara. So I thought maybe we could set the scene a bit and talk about um, key uh, background information around the current situation of forced displacement. So actually when we look at the numbers, forced displacement has almost doubled in the past 10 years, um, going from around 41 million in 2010 to now almost 79.5 million. Um, this is actually one in every 97 people that are displaced in the world. Um, among them are nearly 26 million refugees, so those who are uh, crossing the international borders to seek protection. And around half of the refugee po uh, population are under the age of 18. Now, when we look at where they're coming from, 68% come from just five countries, Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Myanmar. And 85% of these refugees live in developing countries, so generally a country neighboring the one they fled. Um, and these countries are oftentimes already poor with limited resources and capacity. And this is why UNHCR, along with the international community, has really been advocating for this whole of a society approach to the refugee response and really looking at ways to find solutions and share the responsibility globally through international cooperation. Now, as I just uh, mentioned, um, nearly half of the refugee population are under the age of 18, and children and youth are among the most vulnerable victims of displacement and often the most in need. So what are some of the key challenges that the displaced young people face? Well, first is psychosocial distress. So a lot of the displaced young people have experienced um, disturbing events such as violence, war, loss of family member. Um, leaving them oftentimes very distressed, depressed, and sometimes experiencing some mental health issues. Um, they also experience a disruption in their daily routines or daily lives, right? And a disruption in the relationships that um, connect them with to their peers or families um, and communities, um, leaving them cut off from the support systems that they used to have. And this all leads um, 
sorry, another uh, area is um, challenge that they face is the protracted situation that they're in. So many of the refugees actually uh, spend their time in forcibly displaced settings for more than 10 to 20 years um, with very limited access to education or any other livelihood opportunities and without the right to work or with no certainty of a solution in the future. Young people are often uh, unable to plan a future life for themselves and have uh, described their lives being in this state of limbo, which all leads to some of protection challenges that we're able to identify. For example, young people are oftentimes in risk of being trafficked or forced recruitment. Um, they take up harmful coping strategies such as substance abuse, survival sex, or early child marriage. Um, they're more vulnerable to abuse, neglect, exploitation, as well as sexual and gender-based violence. I'll hand it over to Kiara to talk a little bit around the challenges in education. Thanks, Megumi. So um, when it comes to education, um, refugee children and youth experience other challenges and some other barriers. So unfortunately, refugee children and youth do not have the same educational opportunities as their national peers. So as you can see on the slide, at primary school level, only 77% of refugee children are in school. And, it, and as you can see, the statistics worsen dramatically as we go to secondary and tertiary education, with 31% of refugee youth enrolled in secondary education and only 3% of refugees attending higher education, so only 3% of refugees studying at university level. Um, so, as you know, we live in a very challenging time and COVID has caused an unprecedented situation where an entire generation worldwide, so no matter where you are, but an entire generation has had its education interrupted. And this might actually have happened to you too, if you are a student yourself. So you might have had to stop going to school for a few months and you might have had to connect online where possible or do some catch up exercises. But this time is particularly challenging for refugees who even before the COVID-19 outbreak were already at a severe disadvantage. So refugee children and youth of school age were already before COVID more likely to be out of school at all grades as known refugees. And you can see these in the second box on the slide. You can see that 48%, so half of the world, refugee children are out of school. And COVID-19 is threatening, is, is actually threatening to make the situation even worse. And it is uh, threatening to make this situation worse and worse and destroying dreams and ambitions of young refugees who are studying. So for refugees who were struggling already to be in school, what happens when schools are closed can be absolutely devastating. Um, and there is also the possibility that refugee children and youth do not return to school. So the protection risks that Megumi just explained become bigger and bigger if they are associated with refugee children and youth not being able to go to school. And if we think about female refugees, so if we think about um, girls, they may not actually return to their classroom when they reopen. So it was already particularly challenging for them before, with girls being half less as likely to be in secondary education, for example, as boys. And this is actually a very, very big issue as education, especially secondary education for female refugees, has huge benefits. So as you, as you might know, uh, females uh, who are in school are more likely to marry later. Educated females make choices when they have children later and when they are economically active. And so they are more likely to send their children to school. So um, I just wanted to, to, to walk you through these, these statistics and highlight that there is actually not just the risk for this generation, but um, the huge impact that COVID is having on refugee education is also concerning future generations. And now that we have set the scene and gain a better understanding about what it means to be a refugee and what are the distinct protection challenges that refugee children and youth experience, I'm handing over to Megumi, who will explain how sport can actually help 
countering these challenges. Great. So why sport is the question. Well, first of all, uh, of course, sport is fun. It provides a moment of relief from the daily struggles or challenges that young people are facing. Um, and it also just brings a moment of laughter and joy. But because it's so fun, it's also indeed a very effective and meaningful way to engage young people in other activities. Also, it provides normalcy or a routine to young people's lives that has been disrupted. Um, and I'm sure that anyone who's played sport before could um, attest to this is that, you know, sport, playing sports provide this kind of a unique uh, connecting force to, to build friendships, to learn about teamwork, to learn about respect and mutual understanding. And finally, it provides an environment for development and self-empowerment. So uh, a place where young people can build skills and, and capacities. And this is why UNHCR has been looking into tapping into this enormous potential of sport to help displace communities in innovative ways to be able to protect them and improve their lives. Um, and organized sport activities can create the support environment for young people to come together to team up um, and, for example, enhance their well-being, not just physically, but mentally, um, to uh, seek avenues to access opportunities to be able to develop valuable life skills such as teamwork, leadership, or communication. It's also a way to increase social connectedness. So you find friends, mentors, role models um, by uh, engaging in sport activities, which increase this social connectedness. Um, it promotes diversity and inclusion, and also forge closer ties, not just within refugee communities, where refugees are coming from many different backgrounds, nationalities, or ethnicities at times, but also between refugee and host communities. And essentially, sport um, is um, becoming a vehicle to create um, inclusive and cohesive communities. I'll hand it back to Kiara to talk a little bit about the connection between sport and education. Thank you, Megumi. So in the previous slides, we saw that issues around access to education are unfortunately common for refugee children and youth. And despite all children having a right to education, many, too many refugee children and youth are missing out on education. And we are also seeing right now the protective power of sport and how sport can connect refugees and how sport can be a powerful tool for social inclusion and social cohesion. So let's now, as Megumi said, take a look at the positive impact that sport can have on education. And you can see on this slide a few uh, positive benefits that sport can bring to education. So sport activities seem to be extremely beneficial also in school settings, so also in the classroom. Sport activities can serve as an incentive for children in forced displacement to go and stay in school. So if we include sport activities in the school day, we can help attract new groups of students to schools who would not otherwise attend. And we have also seen that sport is a tool for protection and it does offer a danger-free and accessible space. So sport can promote health, social development by offering a unique combination of physical exercise, skill development, ability to overcome stress, adversity. It can help counteract psychosocial problems, stress and loneliness in the classroom and outside the classroom. And think about uh, females. So think about uh, female refugees and how through sport gender equity can be promoted and gender norms can be challenged and these can be challenged again inside and outside the classroom we can also think about how sport can contribute to schooling in general so how sport can enhance youth empowerment so it can bring more learning opportunities it can help uh, strengthen confidence it does um, help creating new interactions with peers. And finally, sport is a way to create, as we said already, a positive peer relationship with other, with other people who can be refugees or host community people. So bringing children, youth, regardless of their communities closer together. And it does help 
improve mutual understanding. It helps understand what diversity is and what, why diversity is so important. It helps improve empathy among children, again, inside and outside the classroom. So now that you are mastering the theory, let's do a big dive into the practice and I can see the slide. So here we are going to walk you through three examples, uh, so three case studies that showcase uh, some ways sport is being used to connect refugees and host communities and to empower young refugees. And we are going to start with Rosman. So we're going to start with Iran. Over to you, Megumi. Sure. So let's meet uh, Rosma Gafuri. Um, she is a founder of a project in Iran that uses football as a tool to foster inclusion and provide opportunities for refugee girls. Um, Rosma herself is an Afghan refugee, and actually very recently she was awarded a very prestigious award from UNHCR in recognition for her impactful work. So what does the project do? So every day, Rosma and her team of volunteers go door to door to the neighborhoods in Shiraz uh, in Iran to talk to the families who have children who, despite, of course, their very young age, have to work to help their parents um, and support their families. Um, what Rosma and her team does is to seek permission for the children to come to sports and football practice, um, hoping that um, sports can act as an entry point where her team will get to know the challenges and difficulties that the children are facing. And through these uh, organized football activities, the project is able to really provide mentoring and psychosocial support um, that covers topics such as child protection, how to build trust, um, and ways in which community members could support each other. What's amazing is that as the parents start seeing the positive change that sport activities can have on their children, they become more willing to let them go to school. Um, and while both boys and girls in this community must often work to help their families, girls do face the, the added challenge of the cultural norms, which view um, it as unnecessary for daughters to, to be educated. But through this project and Rosma's work, um, now the project is able to support around 400 children a year, uh, many of them being out of school girls. Um, through inclusion in these sports and recreational activities, as well as increasing their access to educational opportunities. Rosma also thinks that football is gradually becoming more accepted in the Afghan community as a sport for girls and, and a way to really empower the girls. So without further ado, let's meet Rosma uh, through a video. Great. Um, so next, um, we wanted to introduce you to this uh, example um, now in Africa in Kenya, Kakuma. So there is a Kakuma United football team in Kenya, Kakuma, which is a football club uniquely composed of players from seven different nationalities, um, drawn from both refugee camps and the nearby Kalubay settlement and Kenyans from the local hosting community. And just to mention that Kakuma and Kalubay settlement has a combined population of around 187,000 people, but youth making over 60% um, of the population. So really creating this uh, football team um, was an innovative way to keep the youth constructively engaged, to be able to identify um, and develop the talents that exist among the young people of Kakuma, and especially for younger players and youth to have something to look, look up to, to dream of, and to work hard. Um, what's amazing is that um, the Kakuma United football team is now integrated into the Kenyan National League, um, and they're playing in the Division Two. And it was really an opportunity for young people to come together, um, to learn about embracing diversity, to be able to make friends, build a team, and forge closer ties both within the refugee community as well as the host community. And has really become a symbol of unity and, and peace um, in this community. So um, I won't uh, uh, go further into detail because we have a great uh, video that shows the impact of this uh, project in the community.
So now moving on to the third case study and the final one. So this case study shows exactly how sport can be integrated in education. And as we have been discussing and we have been seeing in these videos, sport really has a protective role and it can benefit a lot uh, education. So UNHCR has been looking at how to integrate sport activities in education programs. And we had started doing this together with Generation Amazing, uh, Educate a Child, Education Above All Foundation and the Jesuit Worldwide Learning um, trying to see how to include an innovative and exciting component in uh, a primary education program. So here on the slide, you can see uh, that EAC, Generation Amazing and UNHCR are working together on the so-called Sport for Protection Initiative. This initiative essentially consists of three different layers. So let's have a look at the three different layers. So if we look at layer number one, so where you can see the American football ball, the idea is to uh, enroll refugee youth on a blended learning course. So when, it, when we say blended, it means that it is, uh, the course happens both in classroom and online. And through this blended learning course, youth will be trained as sport for protection facilitators. So they will gain the capacity to deliver sport for protection activities. Uh, once this blended learning course will be finalized, we will pass on to the second layer of this uh, initiative, which you can see um, with the mark with the football ball. So uh, youth will then receive a specialized training in football for development activities. And again, once this training will be finalized, youth will deliver, and this will be the third layer of our initiative, so the one with the volleyball um, ball, and youth will deliver sport for protection and football for development activities in primary schools. So youth themselves will engage primary school age refugee children, and they will be essentially a platform to reach out to, to children who are out of school and try to encourage them to enroll and stay in primary education. So they will engage them through fun days activities, sport, football activities, and they will contribute to make education accessible for all. And now that we have completed our uh, hat trick of case studies, I'm tossing the ball back to Megumi, who will explain what it means for refugee children and youth not being able to continue sport activities and not being able to go to school. Great, thank you, Kiara. And I think Kiara went into detail um, some of the impacts that the COVID-19 pandemic have had on refugee children and youth. Of course, we're all going through the COVID-19 pandemic and feeling its impact on our lives, but it the pandemic indeed has had a significant impact on the lives of refugees and actually increased the vulnerability of children and youth. One aspect being the cessation or the halt of sport activities, schooling, informal activities um, in their lives. And with this disruption in their daily lives, there has been rise in psychosocial distress, so increasing levels of anxiety or uncertainty. Um, children and youth are no longer able to benefit from the protective and safe environments that the sport activities were offering, um, and the pos positive coping strategies that um, are being replaced by negative coping strategies um, such as lower self-confidence, um, loss of dreams for the future, so on and so forth. However, um, our sport partners, um, along with UNHCR, has been trying to innovatively adapt to the situation to be able to continue delivering these activities and the benefits of sport activities to the refugee children and youth. So let me go into some of the examples to showcase um, what kind of innovation has taken place and mainly um, in, in three areas. So one is, um, you know, harnessing technology and using online platforms to stay connected. So the first picture is from UNHCR Jordan, um, working with an organization called Peace in Sports and with the International Table Tennis Foundation. Um, we work together to organize online table tennis sessions in Zatari Refugee Camp um, to be able to continue the engagement, but also uh, provide opportunities for refugee youth to continue enhancing their skills. 
Um, the bottom picture here um, in the first column is actually World Taekwondo holding its first virtual international Taekwondo championships um, in June, where 10 refugee children from the ASRAC refugee camp participated. So really staying connected using technology and online platforms. And the second area of, of adaptation is really um, in the sport activities itself and trying to stay active in a safe manner. Um, so the first uh, photo here in the second ca uh, column is from the Zatari re refugee camp where um, youth have become creative. Um, they actually saw a social media post of a group of Argentinian football fans adopting a new method of playing football while respecting the social distancing measures called human foosball um, and young refugees decided to try it out um, for themselves and um, thus uh, they're you know uh, staying active um, interacting um, while respecting the COVID-19 prevention measures um, also below the MK refugee camp in DRC you see some people jump roping here but app partners have shifted the sport activities to those that could be done individually like jump roping or cycling um, and if, in respect to the social distancing measures and the third uh, area of kind of the adaptation is actually using sport as a tool to promote COVID-19 preventive measures and to disseminate um, credible information. So many of our partnering organizations have developed toolkits, curriculums, um, and uh, coaches has been trained to use sport activities as an entry point um, to disseminate safe information, but also to promote uh, preventative measures such as hand washing or how to cough in public, um, integrating that into um, certain sport drills um, and really using a sport as a place uh, for refugee youth and children to be able to learn. Um, of course, we will be living uh, in a it seems like we will be living in a socially distanced world for a while longer. So we do hope that these innovative practices are continued and shared um, to be able to encourage the continuation of using sport as a tool to engage with young people uh, during these challenging times. Over to you, Kiara. Thank you, Megumi. Um, so this was all from us and we can move on to the questions and answers uh, session. So if you have any questions, do feel free to write them in the chat or uh, unmute yourself. We're very happy to address any questions you have. Uh, we hope that uh, the presentation was, was helpful and you got inspired to team up and stand up for, for refugees. Do feel free to, to send any questions in the chat or to to just unmute yourself and, and ask a question. I did uh, receive a, a direct message question regarding the, the training of, of young refugees. Um, are there certain kind of career opportunities that they can look at? And what are some of the things that you have to consider when you look at um, training refugees to become young coaches? Great. Okay. Thank you so much for, for the question. Um, so this is actually a very, very, very good question. Uh, what is important to remember is that UNHCR is really prioritizing accredited training and as UNHCR, UNHCR together with partners. So um, if we think back to the initiative uh, that UNHCR is implementing together with Generation Amazing and uh, the Educate a Child program from the Education Above All Foundation, that course is actually accredited. So uh, this is actually great because, um, you know, refugees often do not have access to accredited education and um, non-accredited education sometimes may lead them to uncertain future learning pathways and uncertain employment opportunities. So in this, in this initiative, we're really trying to include sport into education, but at the same time, uh, we're really trying to provide refugees with uh, an accredited certification at the end of the course so that they can they can build on that and they can use it in their future for a better future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think... Um... Well, it's quite perfect as we are approaching 1.45 and I believe the workshop um, was 45 minutes. Um, unless there's any other questions. I mean, we, we also um, 
uh, here uh, noted our contacts, um, both for the refugee sport coordination team and the education section. So if there are any other follow up questions or if you like more information, please always feel free to reach out. Yeah, yeah back. sure. Um, I'm just checking if there is any other direct questions or in the chat. It seems no, but as Megumi said, really feel free to reach out to us. Here you have the email addresses. We are very happy to, to have a conversation with you uh, and try to understand what is the, the power of sport when it comes to, to, refugee, um, to refugee settings. And as we really would like to finish on time, uh, it, it has been a pleasure. And so we want to thank you, all of you, for your interest in this workshop. Thank you for taking the time to attend it um, and for actively participating. Uh, I see that Mohammed has a question. Um, Mohammed, um, I, 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 sorry, I have received a direct message from Mohammed. Mohammed, would you mind just typing the question in the chat, or otherwise you can you can just reach out to us. Um, so Megumi uh, is part of the Refugee Sports Coordination Team, and you have the, the email on the slides, and I'm part of the Education section. So feel free to reach out to us. Uh, to ask any questions. So as I said, really, thank you so much for taking the time to attend this workshop and for, for your participation with the Mentimeter activity. And we really hope you got inspired by this workshop and you're, as I said, you're ready to team up and stand up for refugees. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you.